close. Thank you very much, and uh, welcome to day three of Referendum TV. This is our experiment in takeover of television. We're here at the Hill Street Theatre in Edinburgh at the Edinburgh Festival, venue 41. We've got a, our audience uh, here. We have a live show. We have guests, lots and lots of them. And we have sofas, at least two. Uh, but here's the thing. Uh, this is not being produced by any commercial organization or by the BBC. What you're about to see is entirely the creation of a very enthusiastic band of volunteers here who have been using off-the-shelf equipment and are demonstrating that there is some truth in the claim. Instead of bemoaning the media, you should become the media. Anyway, that's our experiment. It's going to be a little bit rough. Uh, it always is. Uh, but I'm joined now by one of the new stars of the video firmament, uh, Stephen Payton, who has become really very well known. <laughs> He's become a name in Scotland with his, uh, his uh, weekly indie ref reviews, which are both sharp, cutting, and incredibly well produced. He also owns his own video company. He's going to be one of our presenters uh, over the next few weeks. Tell us a bit about yourself. Sure. Well, yeah, uh, I run a video company based in Glasgow. And uh, as kind of time was going on, I got really interested in the kind of campaign and the referendum. Yes, and campaign. Yeah, of course. <laughs> and uh, just looking at the politics, and, and I felt like a lot of the ways that things were being reported wasn't really doing justice to the yes side, and decided I want to get involved, really. And because I had this company, I had okay. a way to do that. In what way is it not reflecting campaign? Well, it seemed, I mean, if you count it back to even all that stuff with uh, Vote No Borders, it seemed that they released a press release and they recovered the BBC non-stop and um, they've kind of just fretted away to nothing. But when the same kind of release came from the Yes side, there was nothing. Yeah. It seemed that there was very little coverage, it was very little research done and no one went to National Collective, of course, um, Artists for Independence, in response to this other group coming so you forward. you know, by frustration to becoming your own media? Pretty much, yeah. yeah. It, was, uh, it wasn't until I started somebody actually sent me the uh, Jello by Afro quote, don't hate the media, become the media. And it's a very fitting quote for what's happening right now uh, in the referendum. Going around? Yeah, absolutely. There's so much content coming out from, I mean, I've got my thing, but uh, there's more video. People are making their own blogs, there's alternative news sites. People have really kind of grasped what this referendum is and what it can mean and ran with it and created their own content yeah. for where they felt it was lacking. Right. Yeah. Well, Sarah B.D. Smith, you're going to be another of our presenters later on uh, in the run. You've been managing our Twitter account. How's it been going so far today? Well, it's still going strong just now. Um, we're up to 2,000 followers in, in the first couple of days, so it's fantastic to have that support from you. <laughs> And, and of course, I think it's testament to how media is done today um, mm. and how campaigning is done today, that, that social media is such a core part of that. And whether it's YouTube or Twitter or Facebook or things like Vine, you know, they've got like little things coming out now. I saw yesterday Generation Yes and are now using BuzzFeed, um, the kind of uh, web website yeah. of, of the youth, if you like, of, of kind of meme creation mm. that um, folk are actually really embracing social media. Yeah. Um, so we're tweeting at Referendum TV, that's our, our handle. It's all way above my head, of course. I don't really understand. <laughs> <laughs> you're actually, you're, That's I, why we're here. I can get my head just about around the fact that we're actually transmitting this as a television programme, but you have another dimension to it there on your lap. Yeah, absolutely, and, and we're sort of tweeting constantly 24 hours at the moment, um, and great conversations with people having on online as well. So um, just to give you a wee flavour of the kind of things that people are saying just in the first couple of days, um, we had uh, the lovely Charlie Muppet, that's his handle, says, just watch today's referendum TV, a breath of fresh air, and as one guest said, as much info in two minutes as from two years of the usual telly. Um, and, and another John Corbett, or Corbett under slash John, um, says, giving good, valuable information, welcoming both sides in a relaxed format. Why is the BBC not like this? Mm -hmm. So it's obvious that the world of Twitter is, is getting some, some good uh, responses out there. And you can keep tweeting along with the hashtag RefTV, um, and we'll include you in part of the show. Excellent. Well, Thanks very much, and we'll speak to you later on yep. uh, with your Green Party hat on, because we'll be talking about the uh, mass cameras, uh, RIC's uh, mass cameras. So thanks very much, Sarah okay. Beauty Smith. Thank and you very much. Oh, yes, yes. As, we, as we come back to the grim reality of analog 
uh, theatre, because of course we are real people. <laughs> we're uh, actually in this uh, theatre itself, and we we'll hope to bring in the audience a bit later on as we discuss uh, different aspects of the day's events. But Stephen's been looking through the Sunday papers on our behalf. We're going to mm -hmm. have a quick chat about that. What's uh, struck your eye? Yeah, well, first of all, we obviously have uh, Sunday Telegraph running with uh, the story that we may be going back to Iraq. Uh, again, uh, what's your opinion on the coverage? Uh, well, uh, well, it's, uh, it's, it's actually quite a difficult one for many of the papers to uh, call because mm -hmm. uh, what's really worrying about this, and of course this is reports of um, the uh, President Obama deciding to go ahead with uh, limited airstrikes in northern Iraq to try to suppress the Islamic State and try to prevent uh, what appears to be ethnic cleansing uh, in that uh, region. But obviously, the very disturbing echoes of the Iraq war here. Um, I mean, these are the first, this is the first American military engagement in Iraq since 2011, since the war was supposed to have finished. Uh, Barack Obama agonized before getting involved in this at all, and he keeps insisting there will be uh, no boots on the ground. There'll be, this is not going to be a resumption of the Iraq war, but obviously the imagery uh, is very disturbing. And I think one of the reasons why the commentators and most of the press are so, you know, are concentrating exclusively on the humanitarian aspect is they don't really know where to go on it. A lot of particularly liberal commentators don't want to say, yeah, go for it, let's, you know, bomb the living daylights out of them, mm -hmm. uh, because that looks awfully like getting stuck into Iraq again. And so many people were appalled by the original invasion of Baghdad, the original Iraq war. It was a very big political issue in Scotland, if you remember. Uh, and so, no, naturally people don't want to be too gung-ho about that. On the other hand, it's very difficult to see what else we can do because there's 100,000 people here, there's terrible accounts of uh, families, children dying uh, up in the mountains trying to escape from these Islamic extremists. And I think a lot of people are thinking, well, something has to be done. Hmm. And what do you think these developments will have on Scotland? Well, it's difficult to say. I mean, I don't think we can, uh, you know, I mean, you know, I don't think we can sort of uh, map this particularly onto the referendum campaign or anything mm -hmm. like that. I don't think it has any direct relevance to that at all, except, as I say, reminding us uh, about the terrible aftermath of the Iraq war, which mm -hmm. was, uh, people were very uh, hostile to that. People were deeply upset morally in Scotland about about the that intervention, about Britain's involvement in the Iraq war. Mm -hmm. um, and this does remind us that we went in there, we broke the place up, but we didn't fix it. And this is a, an, this is another part of the legacy of that uh, terrible episode. Mm. Great. And we also have, well, Boris Johnson ah, ev yes. <laughs> everywhere in the papers. Um, Boris, yes. Just a <laughs> Uh, interesting it's thinking, yeah, uh, thinking He's about... Back. He is Actually back. He never went He's away, back. did he? I, unfortunately, no. <laughs> uh, what do you think about his running for the PM uh, position? Well, I mean, the first thing to say is yeah. I'm sure a um, lot of people in this audience will probably agree that if, if it was, say, the leader of Glasgow Council, Gordon Matheson, who was standing to become an MSP, mm. would you get this mass coverage of it in the UK papers? Of course you wouldn't. He's the mayor of uh, London, and, and you know, therefore he's assumed to be of tremendous interest to everybody. But obviously, there's a, you know, there's an important political story here. It's a personality story apart from anything else. He's he's moved straight onto David Cameron's lawn by telling him, well, you've got to now, you've got to come out, David Cameron, and say you're prepared to leave the EU, you know, because as you know, they're planning this referendum on Europe. And that's very much Boris's game plan. And the ref I mean, the significance for us, of course, and I think the significance of the referendum, and I think this will have a spillover, is that people can see, uh, well, two things. First of all, that uh, the Tory party is moving very rapidly into the UKIP territory, because that's what Boris is doing. He's trying to steal UKIP's clothes, if you like. Uh, but secondly, he's come out with this amazing statement today <laughs> uh, saying that, um, well, he doesn't think Scotland should have any extra tax powers at all. And I, mean, I think I think he's uh, he's just telling it like it is. I think um, I think I think Scotland's going to get very little as as a result of voting no. Uh, I may I may be wrong. I hope I'm proved wrong. If there is a no vote, if it's not a yes, I hope I'm proved wrong. But I suspect that line from Boris, which is basically saying, "Why should the Scots get any special treatment if they vote no?" is going to be very much how the how the Tory Party sees it. And remember, he could be the next prime minister. And then on to also uh, well more focus on the referendum. We have coverage still of the currency union following on from the debate on Absolutely, it won't, it won't go away, how could it? Um, and they're still going around the circles on why Alex Salmon has uh, not come out with a plan B. He has, of course, he 
I mean, he's come up with plan B, plan C, and plan D, but he said that he isn't prepared to contemplate then because he thinks there should be a currency union. He thinks that's the most equitable solution and also the best in the best economic interests of both Scotland and England. He's sticking doggedly to that, uh, but the press is hounding him, uh, as are the opposition parties who say this is incoherent, et cetera, et cetera. And it is, a, it is certainly a problem. I mean, uh, you know, it's, it shows the difficulty of, main, main, of mounting a referendum in this kind of uh, climate. Well, we've got, we're bringing someone on, actually, from the, uh, from the press, uh, George Caravan, uh, who is known to very many people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Stick it to them, George. Hi, That's great, Hi, George. George Carlton, a well-known uh, broadcaster, ex-Labour councillor as well, who, uh, of, of significance, and currently a journalist, uh, and uh, very familiar with these uh, arguments. I mean, do you, do you lament the fact that uh, Alex Salmon hasn't made clearer that there are alternatives to a currency? He and I taught economics as, a, as an academic for 25 years, and trying to explain something as complicated as, 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 as the banking system and international finance uh, even if a whole year with the, with the students in front of you and getting them to read books is difficult enough to try to explain it in this context when the British media, the London media, is determined to uh, confuse, mislead uh, and totally uh, destroy the argument in any intellectual form. I mean, I was reading the, uh, our old friends in, the, in the, uh, the Mail on Sunday this morning and you know, the headline is um, uh, that, that Scotland will, will be refused the pound. Now, every economist in the world knows you can't do that. that if, if, if Alex Salmond and Scotland, whoever's the Scottish government, after independence, wants to keep the pound, they can do so. Governments you know, can, can mandate whichever currency they use. So it, it, we can't be refused. The issues are not to do with whether we can have the well, you know, the plan B you need another currency. The issues are if we keep the pound and there's not a currency union, then what do we do about... Um, uh, uh, Banking. What do we do about protecting banks if there's a bank failure? Um, it's more complicated issues like that than, than denying the currency. Folks, if we have independence, we get to keep the pound if we want it. Uh, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, I know. The, the, this, um, the strategy is very frustrating, obviously, because, uh, you know, as you rightly say, and many economists agree with you, that uh, it would be... England cutting off, or the rest of the UK, ruck, as it's increasingly called, would be cutting its nose off despite its own face. It would be a disaster it, for it England. It would be an economic disaster because it would damage cross-border trade, there'd be transaction costs and all the rest yeah. of it. Nevertheless, you know, in pure hard, crude political terms, there you have all the leaders of the opposition parties all saying, and like Ed Miliband saying, that he will put it in their manifesto yeah. that there will not be yes. a, an absolute cast-iron commitment, there will not be... Um, uh, a common currency uh, if Scotland votes yes. Now we may not believe him, but what are the okay. Scottish voters okay. supposed to make of it? They can't. How, how can they say, well, we're going to ignore that if it's going to be a manifesto yeah, yeah. commitment? I mean, I mean, Simon has to make it very plain that the, 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 the pound note that you have, that you get paid in, that your pension gets paid in, that, that, that your contracts are done in, that, that that stays. I think, I mean, that, that was always the case as far as I was concerned because you, you had to reassure people. Mm. If you tell them there's going to be another currency, you know, groats, bobbies, whatever, <laughs> yeah. you know, and people then have, would genuinely have no idea what, what anything was worth, that would, that would be chaotic. So he has to say we'll keep the pound. The issue is whether there's a currency union. Um, I am fascinated by this because in, in, in most of the cases in, in, in historically, um, uh, Britain has insisted, British governments have insisted on currency unions. Exactly. Right? exactly. Within exactly. India, India is the amazing one. It's a very but interesting. India is an amazing one because it, India, India was a huge, huge economy even, even in, 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 in 47 when India gets independence. But India had had run up the Indian the Indian the Bank of, Eng of India the Central Bank in India which operated under the Bank of England had run up huge reserves of foreign currency because they were trading all through the war. Um, the Labour government in 1947 is desperate to keep those Indian reserves in the Bank of England in the vaults in London, so it forces India to keep a currency union uh, when the Indians didn't want it. Um, so that they could keep the money, and there are years, the, and, and uh, the, there are there are years of debate as the Treasury and, and, and the Indian government officials sit down and argue with one another. Mm. And eventually, 
And of course, the Indians will, will break free. But I mean, the, 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 most of the examples are, are the other way around. Um, yeah. Ireland has, a, has had, a, had, a, had a de facto currency union. Well, they just, they just published the, uh, they printed the Irish pound in a one-to-one -one parity. And actually, UK pounds continue to circulate in uh, the, the Irish Republic it, until it, it, 50 years. The, the, the Irish government the, kept its the, money for, for, for 10 years at the Bank of England. The Bank of England was running the bank. The, the, I mean, we're, we're, talking, we're talking Ireland, you know, who has a massive war to get, to get his independence. Um, the, the real story I love is that um, uh, after Ireland gets its independence, of course, he didn't have a tax system. Uh, and the, when the British realize that, you know, they can't have chaos on the doorstep, the Inland Revenue sends a free, for free a team of its best tax inspectors to Dublin to help the Irish set up their tax system. Now, I mean, if, you know, the, 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 it's, it's, it's so amazing at the moment that the, the current leaderships of the major London parties are quite prepared to destroy... Uh, the, the, the British economy and the, 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 the rest of the UK economy post-independence. There, I mean, I, I, I've never seen such blinkeredness, and that's what Sam is responding to. Uh, I must say that what, his response today in, 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 in the press has been very interesting. Sam is playing hardball now. What he said is, we want a currency union. The, the pound is a common product. Yeah. The um, the uh, uh, the Bank of England we share. Uh, and so if you do not wish, if you're going to break this up, then we take no responsibility for the debt. Ah, but they're That's saying well, that means Scotland will be defaulting on its debt, so we'll be international pariahs that the finance uh, yeah, markets yeah, will yeah, yeah, punish yeah, us yeah, forevermore. But, They'll but, never lend. Let's be, let's be technical. If, if, if the, de the debts that have been accrued, £1.3 trillion pounds worth of, of state debt, uh, is is uh, uh, at the doorstep of the UK Treasury, right? Uh, that's officially they can't, they can't change that. They're, they're signed up to that. I know they have actually but said this. They, very they important. They can't, they can't. You, George Osborne said before his declaration of the pound, he made clear that uh, the rest of the UK after independence would take 100% yep. responsibility for Scotland for the UK debt pile. That's on he, record. He has to because it, well, what was happening before he said that was that the, the, the markets were beginning to panic because they didn't know who was responsible for the debt. Mm. And you wa just watch interest rates go like that. So Osborne said, and because it's, it's a legal thing, the UK Treasury is responsible for the 1.3 billion debt, mm. trillion debt. Now, if Scotland is independent and they refuse a currency union, what Solomon is saying, fine. Mm -hmm. uh, you keep the debts. Now, we have no, so we have no debt. It's not a matter of defaulting. We would have no debts. We would be the, the only major industrial country in the Western world with no yeah. state debt. Mm -hmm. now, <laughs> I can, yeah. uh, so let's, let's be, we'll, we'll, be, we'll be technical about this. Of course the problem would arise if we, if we did that. People would say, well, you're going to play those kind of games. The, the markets would say, because you've got to play those kind of games. Uh, then we're not going to lend the new Scottish government any money. That, that's that. You know, I understand that as an argument. Right. That argument would last five seconds because one thing that the hedge funds like and the big pension funds like is they like to lend money and earn interest. And they're not sentimental. And they're not sentimental. <laughs> so yeah. some, they will, they will, will occur to somebody five minutes yeah. down the line. Here is a government with no debt. Uh, one of the 20 richest countries in the world, they will be able to pay us if we lend them money. And so they will lend money. So Salmon actually has as the Treasury over a barrel, which is why I think there will be some kind of deal. Yeah, the, the open secret is, of course, there will be a deal uh, on, on day one. But thank you very much, George Carolyn, for that. Yes, thank you for George Carolyn. Okay, well, let's, uh, let's move on from finance now because we are in Edinburgh. We are at the Edinburgh Festival, uh, which remains uh, the largest arts festival in the world. In fact, uh, the Fringe alone will be selling about 2.2 million tickets uh, in, at this festival, which is more than the Commonwealth Games, and it does that every year. Uh, I mean, many people involved in the uh, arts in Scotland get very frustrated about this, of course, because they feel that the UK media neglects uh, the arts in Scotland, neglects the Edinburgh Festival, that it doesn't give... Edinburgh, the kind of coverage that it accords to you know, things like Glastonbury, for example. Uh, well, the Edinburgh Book Festival is one of the oldest and one of the largest uh, book festivals uh, in the world. It really <laughs> broke ground in the 1980s. Uh, and it's uh, doing great business again, just up the road in uh, Charlotte Square, as it always does. Um, its director is Nick Barley. He's uh, 
uh, going to be with us uh, in a moment. Um, he's been talking about the significance of culture to the Scottish debate about Scottish identity. They have a theme running throughout uh, this year's Edinburgh Book Festival, Let's Talk, and they cover everything from environmentalism to the Middle East, and inevitably questions of Scottish identity uh, are raised. They've also got, well, just about everyone, haven't they? They've got um, a former Archbishop of Canterbury, Rowan Williams. Um, they've got George R. R. Martin. And we should have Nick Barley. I think he's probably waiting in the wings, so and you come, yeah. Brilliant. Thank you for queuing me up. Uh, well, yeah, I see. I, you, you were supposed to be queued when I mentioned your name, but obviously that doesn't quite work. Never mind. Nice to see you anyway. Nice to see you. It's great. Thanks very much for popping over and waiting uh, around uh, for, for a bit. No. And, and thanks for coming over to the Book Festival yesterday, where your, I think your event was the first to sell out, apart Woo! from George Charles Archer. <laughs> yeah, so, you're so kind. <laughs> well. Anyway, um, anyway that's, that's great news. That's really great news. Um, let's just talk about that, though, because um, uh, politics has been kind of intruding on the uh, on, on the, uh, the book festival this year. At the end of my session, part, part of it was drowned out actually by a pro-Palestinian demonstration taking place outside. Now that, that wasn't actually in the book festival, though. I think was it? No, that was outside the gates of the book festival. Yeah. Right? There had been a march which, from the mound down to uh, outside the first minister's house, which is just outside the gates of the festival, but it, it lent some kind of additional atmosphere, I think, to the yeah. festival this year. And I don't know if you felt it yesterday, and certainly today, there's a kind of buzz around the book festival this year, which I'm sure is to do with the fact that people sense mm. that they're taking part in something historic. Yeah. This is a moment, and, and this is not a, a sort of political statement, because I think whatever the outcome of the referendum, something special has happened here in Scotland, where people have now re-engaged properly with public democracy. Mm. And, and how, is that showing, how is that showing itself at the Book Festival? Well, the really interesting thing is that, uh, and I think that Referendum TV is precisely a, a response to this, that the media have not successfully kept up mm. with the changing mood uh, among the Scottish public. The Scottish public want proper discussion, serious, thoughtful debate, and they feel they've, they've been reduced to a kind of yes-no mm. binary situation, where in fact, of course, there's a whole spectrum of different ideas within the yes camp. Lots of different views about what the future might be, and equally within the no camp, lots of different views. And people need something more subtle, more refined, and I think projects like this here today are exactly about that. Well, you made your kind of mission statement for this uh, festival, didn't you? Um, debate, not hate. What did you mean by that? Well, I think, uh, uh, more generally, I think t too much in the last 50 years we've been reduced to a kind of numeric understanding of, of the world. Big data. Big data. I've got a real problem with big data. <laughs> the way that, that we're reduced to numbers, fringe shows to reduce the star ratings, percentages. Will, will it really be 49% of the Scottish electorate who are the losers after this referendum? Is that all we're going to come out with? I don't think that's right. Whoever is the winner and the loser, we're still going to be a nation. So, so we have to talk about the future. We have to talk about how we can be together. Yeah. The worst possible thing that's happened in this whole five years is the fact there isn't a third question on the, on the referendum and that therefore we're reduced to... A devil max or federalism question, yeah. Precisely. We're divided, mm. whatever our, our views on this, and that's a problem. So I think we, as, as a public, have to, to refuse that, and we have to say, let's just think about this and work out. Of course we want the best future for Scotland, but we're going to have to live together afterwards as well. Absolutely. Now, I mean, you, you have, you're not avoiding politics altogether, or even politicians. You've got Alex Salmond, he's going to be there, and Gordon Brown. But it's interesting, you've, you're not putting them together you put them in a different context. Well, you know, um, that was very deliberate. I've put Alex Salmon together with uh, Tom Devine, Sir Tom Devine now, an historian, and, and you know, the, they will not fight one another on stage. They will talk together, and they will track Scotland's history from 1707 through to now, and both of them will be given a chance to explain why they think Scotland is going in the direction it's going. Mm. And to balance that in a separate event, Gordon Brown will talk to Alistair Moffat, another historian and writer. Again, their views aren't necessarily against one another. And it's an opportunity, rather than this kind of boxing match style of, of public TV, for them to outline what they believe and give us a chance to listen. And then maybe after 45 minutes of hearing that, to ask questions. For me, it's a, it's a better way of, of understanding uh, public debate. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, that's, this is the kind of what the, the book festival really pioneered, didn't it? Uh, under yourself and under your predecessors. I mean, it's kind of been laboring now under this uh, terrible phrase, Woodstock of the mind, uh, <laughs> which was, I think, what uh, 
I think it was Bill Clinton said that about the Hay Festival, but everyone, everyone now comes out with this cliché, but uh, yeah. is there anything in it? But, well, um, I, th I think that's one of those kind of slightly meaningless media phrases. <laughs> uh, there are other things that I've heard it said which have been far too rude to be able to, <laughs> to say um, on this. Um, I think the important thing is that a literary festival is not just about celebrities. Okay, you know, the media is obsessed with celebrities, and, and if somebody famous, you know, Barack Obama says something about the, the Scottish referendum and, they, and makes the headlines, you know, well, I don't think that's necessarily the reason why people should be put on the stage. I think we have to ask whether their ideas are any good. And the book festival down the road uh, has become well known for championing new voices, new writers. You know, and that it's, it's now a kind of bit, it's in the folklore of the book festival. Well, J.K. Rowling's first event was to, to an, in front of an audience smaller than this in 1997. This is a perfectly formed audience, I think. Yeah, yeah. It's a big. It's not just about numbers. Audience. It's not about big yeah, data. Yeah. So I think her first audience was 16 people, um, yeah. and then two years later, you know, you couldn't get a ticket. They were they were like hen's teeth. Mm. It's, for me, that really matters. That it's the quality of the ideas rather than the, the scale of the celebrity. And, you know, that we'll hang on to that. Now, you've got uh, everyone. You've got Rowan Williams. Um, you've got George R.R. R. Martin of Game of Thrones. Will he keep he, be keeping his clothes on, I hope? <laughs> I hope so, yeah. Um, I, I think it's the fans that, that um, I'm interested in meeting because we hear word that they're going to be turning up uh, with Are swords and, and dressed up. And they'll be queuing all the way down past this theatre, I think. Really? So Excellent. Excellent. OK, well, as we say, the, uh, uh, the Edinburgh Festival is uh, up the road from here in uh, Hill Street. This is Hill Street Venue 41, uh, Edinburgh Book Festival. There's still some tickets available. They do tend to sell out very rapidly because I think you know, you, you've tried to contain it, haven't you, in that very small space in Charlotte Square. Yeah. Uh, but that means you, it's, most of the events are sold out. Most of the events sell out, uh, but it's interesting that, oh. that yours was so quick to sell out. Um, the important thing is that we like, like to keep it intimate because it's, you know, we could sell 10 times the number of tickets for George R. R. Martin. But what kind of mm. a, an atmosphere would we get? Yep. Um, it's about the specialness of the experience. Good. Well, best of luck. Thanks very much for best coming in. Nick Barley. Yeah. <laughs> Stephen. So obviously, we've seen lots of performances and plays on at the Fringe just now that have to do with the referendum and the kind of yes/no uh, question. And one of the plays on is called Three Thousand Trees. And while it's not entirely about yes or no. It more focuses on the history of a Yes advocate, an SNP activist by the name of William McRae, who was possibly assassinated. Uh, we have uh, George Gunn, the playwright, and Libby MacArthur, the director, uh, on next to have a wee chat about yeah. that. Hi guys, thanks for joining us. So, um, why now? Why, why is this play like really important and that, that we're kind of having it at this time? Well, it's, it's the nature of history. I mean, I've been wanting to write this play for since 1985, and I'm a great believer that plays find their moment, you know, so... And the director. It's <laughs> <and> the director. <laughs> Very fortunate, Olivia MacArthur, uh, as director, couldn't ask for a better one. Oh. Politically, uh, you know, we're, we're absolutely sympathetic. It would be hellish to, if a Tory directed your play, which has happened to me in the past. <laughs> but the point about Willie McRae is that, uh, you know, in 1985, you know, you have to remember what the country was like, or the state was like, rather, in 1985. Just had the end of the miners' strike. Uh, the security forces were out of control. You know, they'd, they'd won their war. Uh, we had the Falklands War. We had a failed referendum before that, you know, the, the rigged referendum of 79. So 1985, Willie McRae was on his way to Dorney, right, to his holiday house. And the following Monday, he was uh, going to Thurzo, which is where I come from, for a preliminary meeting of the Nyrex dump inquiry, a public inquiry, a preliminary meeting of that. And he had stuff, and his last words to his secretary was, I've got them now. The tragedy is, though, they got him. And that's what happened to William McRae. He was murdered. There's no two ways about it. But I'm a great believer in democracy. Democracy is a you know, tragedy, which is what William McRae's story is. The 3,000 trees is a tragedy. But tragedy is invented by a democratic society. And it's where, in the theatre, like we are today, we are meeting to discuss our ideas in public. And that's the difference between all that celebrity stuff that Nick was talking about. Consumers occupy private space. 
dramatists, directors, actors, us, the audience, we occupy public space. And in Scotland, we have to discuss our problems, our tragedies in public. That's how we will progress as a, a democratic, progressive country. Never mind pounds or bucky groats or whatever the hell you want at all. <laughs> it's about those ideas that we have to articulate. And Definitely a large part of the Yes movement is focused on the idea, that, as you say, that this is bigger than whether or not we're a wee bit richer, a wee bit poorer, and uh, kind of, I guess, examining the relationship that we've had with Westminster, which I suppose um, this is also about. Um, do, do you think it's important that we're really looking at how we've, how we've worked with Westminster over the years? Of course it is, and we've always got a kicking. I mean, I'm not talking to you as some airy fairy poet, you know, although I am that, as you can tell by the hat. <laughs> I worked for 10 years in the North Sea, and before that I worked three years in a trawler at Aberdeen, and I tell you, that kicks the romance out of your soul. So I know what the British state is, I know what capitalism is, but I know this also, that fiction, which is what I'm talking about, because the play is not really about William McCray, it's about a guy called William Mackay. But fiction only works if it's 100% true. That's the catch of art. Uh, and that's, you know, th I think the best thing that we can do is a, as a people is to vote yes. Uh, and I was at a Gaza thing yesterday uh, on the mound, and there's a guy selling socialist worker. And I said, you're all for freedom for Palestine, and that's great, so am I. I'm from Thurzo, you know. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Stop bombing the bloody life out of these people, just let them be. And, of course, I said, what about your stance on Scottish independence? And he said, oh, I'm not, f I'm not for that. I thought, I just, I must be going mad. I can't yeah. understand. I can't square that one. But we are theatre people, you know, and theatre is important yeah. to Scotland. And I believe after the referendum, I think in the future, uh, theatre will become increasingly important. Yeah, and as you say, it's using lies to tell the truth. So well, it's, it's, it's not, it's fiction. It's not lies, it's fiction. No. It's a different yeah. thing. I'd, yeah, I would say the absolute opposite. <laughs> I would say that the, 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 the truth in the piece is very... Um, right at the heart of it, which is why it was such an attractive project. Mm. You know? It's not just theatre. I mean, uh, for me, the broadcast media world that I've been in for all these years, we, we've been frustrated for ages about what's, you know, this is what's so nice about today, you know, um, what we're getting news-wise, you know, and what we're getting work-wise. I mean, there's no more commissioning power in Scotland, you know, um, big... You know, How do you mean no more commissioning? Well, no one in Scotland can commission an idea. You know, if I went to BBC Scotland, I said, oh, I've got this great idea for a sitcom, I've got this brilliant idea for a drama. You know, no, no, there isn't one person in Scotland that can OK it unless it goes through London. We became so London-centric in, in, in my world and in theatre. Mm -hmm. I mean, f for me, when I read George's piece, there was very much a, a journey between myself and all my uh, friends and family and work mates towards yes because it just seemed to make so much sense that, that, that we were in a situation that we weren't before where the UK had turned into this kind of really imbalanced kind of place where London centricness was, was at root and, and it was so frustrating in, in, in my job in my world but it was frustrating as somebody who watched the telly you know it was frustrating as somebody who loves you know the news and watches stories you know so at the time when I read 3000 Trees um it just it landed in my lap at a time and I just thought, this is the most beautiful thing I've ever read. And for me, it's kind of not about the great good man who was Willie McCree, or indeed Willie Mackay, the character that George has turned him into. It's a much bigger theme than that. It's about choice, it's about responsibility, it's about accountability, it's about opportunity. I mean, one of the things about George's piece is he calls it a tragedy. I finished reading it and thought, oh my, I feel great. Mm -hmm. I feel enriched and enlivened. And, and you know, how can something that is about... Um, a, a horrible situation where a great good man is silenced in that kind of brutal fashion. So you, leave you, you think he was silenced? I mean, you you said that you talked about the the truth that lies at the heart of the mm. fiction. I mean, is that, is well, that he, he, he had a bullet? He, he had a bullet in the back of his head. Do you know what I think? The truth of the lies in the heart of it. I tell you, you know what I think the truth is. The truth is that this system doesn't work. One of the great things about um, what we're all realising now is. See the idea of the big clown that is Boris going into, in, in, in a, a more dangerous man I don't think we could ever hope to meet, you know, mm. who's kid on his a buffoon. You know, what's happening just now, the trajectory of what's happening in Westminster is terrifying. Mm. It's also has... 
but it has the seeds of its own destruction. And one of the things that comes out in Three Thousand Trees for me is. You know what? You know what's a better way to be. A better way to be is to talk about love. A better way to be, and that's what George's play reeks of. It reeks right. of love. You know? just, just tell us a little bit because people may not be familiar with Willie McRae. Well, Willie was a Glasgow lawyer, and he joined the army when he was 16, and of course he didn't get in. Then he joined, for some reason, best known to himself, the Indian Royal Navy, and they accepted him. <laughs> so there he there he was uh, in uh, India, just as a teenager, and he, you know, he's people from uh, Kintail typical Glasgow regions, you know, from the highlands. And uh, he, w he was sent out, because he, he was smart, he could read and write, you see, so that was quite unusual. He could, he could read, and he's, he was a very smart man. He's a bit like Hamish Henderson and that, he could learn languages quite easily. So uh, he went off to see these meetings that he was sent out by his, uh, the, 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 his officers, and of course, the meetings were for the Indian National Congress. And they were, this particular part of the world where he was, was all in Urdu. And I thought, oh, I don't know what the hell they're talking about, you know. But it sounded familiar to him because Urdu and Gaelic are not that similar. So he, he, he learned Urdu, and he's, he, he realised that these people were talking about freedom for India. And I thought, God, see, that's a really good idea. Mm -hmm. So this is not what the, his officer sent him out to report back, you know, that freedom for the Indian national, uh, for the, the coming republic after the war was a good idea. So anyway, uh, he... he uh, he came back to Glasgow and he trained as a constitutional lawyer at Glasgow University. And the Indian government, who by then, you know, the Indian National Congress thought so much of him that they asked him back and he, he did contribute a bit to the... the, the run the run, run us fast forward, though, to well, when, then, when then, he then, ended up Then, 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 then he went to, he was, you know, he, that's his thing. But to, he practised law in Glasgow and he was, you know, he was, he was vice president of the SNP. Uh, and he was he was absolutely a hound on the United Kingdom Atomic Energy Authority's tail, yeah. and he won two things, and that's why he was interested in Nyrex in uh, Dunry, which is in Caithness, which is why I was interested in Willie McRae, and that's his story, and, and the state took him out. But you know what's also true about me, and these guys don't come along very often, we're talking about a man who was driven, and his passion was so great, you kind of get a picture of a man who's, you know, leads a kind of monastic life where his cause is the people and his, you know, you get a figure of, of someone who you, they, in a way, they had to take him out because he wasn't going to shut up. You know, he was just going to keep on keeping on. And every, they? Well, well, there is that kind of feeling of he was making a lot of trouble yeah. for, for basically the British government. He was making a lot of trouble. He was basically saying Scotland's being used as a dumping ground. People are signing the Official Secrets Act and they can't speak about it. And that awful sense that you're betraying the folk that you live and work with because you know what's happening, but you've got to keep stum. Mm. You know, these things, uh, these things don't okay. work. They all go pear-shaped in the end, you know. And, and I think the great good man that he was just was noisy. To okay. the point, you know. Right, yeah, you did a really great job in the play of. You saw it. Yes, I have. <laughs> you did a good job, really, kind of showing the scale of his life, you know, yeah. uh, without it being too on the nose. Like yeah. it was quite nice. It's a got, piece yeah. of theatre. I mean, one of the things that I said very early on to George and my producers was, um, I want someone to come off the street who's never even heard of Willie McRae or uh, and, and enjoy a really good bit of theatre. Okay. That's my job. Well, tell us where it's on. How long it's on? Till is this, there's a problem here. There's two uh, oh. plays about Willie. McRae. Both of them are called. 3,000 trees, and I went to the wrong one. <laughs> <It's Yeah. laughs> so tell us where this one is and why they should go to it. It's on the Griffin Theatre in Bread Street, and it starts at 7.15, and it's on every night to the 24th of August, except Mondays. Right. Now, the thing, is, one okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. the thing is, the thing is, there can never be too many plays about this. You know, I, I, I admire <laughs> the guy that wrote 3,000 yeah. trees, yeah. but at least... Why is it 3,000 trees? Well, because Willie wrote the Maritime Law uh, for the State of Israel in 1947, and, uh, and when he was when he was killed, the University of Haifa planted in his honour three thousand trees. Now they might have planted okay. them on Palestinian ground, but the point is that uh, that's what they thought of him, okay. uh, and that's where it is. That's great. Well, right. thank you very much, guys. Uh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, well, we're going to bring out another two people involved in the production of 3,000 Trees. Um, we have Adam Robertson, uh, one of the key actors in it. So, yep. Adam. I think it's Adam and his own. Hey, Adam. Hello. So, uh, how have you found being in 3,000 Trees? Uh, it's been amazing. Uh, the whole journey, I read the play last year when I was touring up through the Hebrides. George Gunn gave me the play. And... Uh, as well as the beauty and power of the landscape I was travelling through, I was reading this 
and stunning piece of writing that uh, took my breath away, literally took my breath away. I had never heard of Willie McRae, um, and that was part of the journey for me. I just thought, how come I know about David Kelly? How come I've heard of Hilda Morell? How come I don't know this incredible Scottish character? Um, so uh, the, the journey from that point to this has been uh, fairly uh, monumental. It's caused uh, many upheavals in my family life. Here I am producing a play in a time where I should be on holiday with my three-year-old and my five-month-old baby, but it was such an important piece of work that um, I, I, I've pulled out all the stops to, to be here. And it's, it's been a great journey. The play's been sold out many nights, mm -hmm. and as the average audience in the Fringe is three people, uh, that's a fact, by the way. After, with there's three and a half thousand productions on, the average audience is three. We have been selling out an 80-seat theatre, so um, it's, been a, it's been great so great. far. Great, and, and I'm right in saying that you've actually came back to Scotland specifically I have, both. I've been away from Scotland I've been expatriated for the last 20 years I'm from Thursday like George up in the north coast and I went down to London to train as an actor uh, and ended up staying down there for 20 well kind of 8 16 years I've been in South Wales living for the last 5 years and but I've been working in Scotland uh, for the last 3 on and off and I started as a no uh, I didn't quite see the point. I suppose like our friends in the Let's Stay Together campaign, <laughs> I kind of felt what well, it felt like a diversion and a bit of a distraction. Mm. But my journey exploring the arguments, and I think for most rational people, when they see the arguments, they become a yes. Um, but I started to get heavily involved in the, bit, the debate, managed to persuade my mum, like Nicola Sturgeon said, if you can persuade one person to vote yes. Uh, I was persuading many. I went to very many uh, meetings myself and Mark McNichol, who's the producer of 3000 Trees, were knocking on doors in Pollock mm. two weeks ago canvassing. So I've been involved in the debate, but I was heard to say, if it's a yes, I'd like to move back to Scotland. Uh, and my wife kind of dismissed that and eventually she said, that's a bit timid, isn't it? You're going to move back once all these folk have done the hard work. <laughs> so that ruminated for a while and I said, let's do it. And so we, we've packed up our bags. We have a cafe uh, restaurant down in South Wales that we've put on the market and we have uh, all of our belongings exist in a garage in Swansea at the moment. And we are in limbo looking for a place to live. Uh, and I'm and myself and my wife are registered to vote. So that's two yes votes in the... Thanks, sir. Yeah. Thanks, Michael. Professionally, I mean, are you know, we've been hearing about the difficulty of getting commissions in Scotland, for example. I mean, are you not a bit concerned about that? Um, not overly, you yeah. know. Someone said this the other day about, uh, you know, concerned about business uh, in an independent Scotland. Money goes business. People trade all over the world, you know, locally and internationally. Business is going to continue. People are going to continue to trade and make money. People are going to continue writing plays, performing plays. And I think that the current state of affairs with uh, public funding for the arts is very dire. You know, Denmark's got a 50 million pound or 50 million euro fund for independent film. We've got a 5 million pound fund for independent film. I think in an independent Scotland, things can only improve. So. I'm as concerned, I'm an actor, I've faced the realities of being out of work a lot. Uh, I'm, a, I'm sure I'll be out of work a lot in an independent Scotland, but that's for me and the rest of the creative uh, community to, to solve hmm. and make sure there's work I mean, for us all. Obviously there's always been a thing where uh, people have almost, particularly actors, have felt that they've had to move south to find work. Yeah, do you think I'm if one. we, yeah, exactly, do you think if we vote yes, there will be more of an incentive to stay in Scotland. That will, I would say yeah. so. I mean, I I left Scotland. One that I, I I couldn't I didn't get an opportunity to train here, mm. but I also uh, when I I came back quite early after I trained and I got one or two jobs and I found it difficult to sustain myself and so I I stayed in London where there is uh, you know like uh, Libby MacArthur is just saying that's where the commissioning power is that's where a lot of the work gets cast. My first Scottish job got cast in London. You know, and so I think that that's wrong. There's a flaw in it. You know, as George Gunn's written in the play, there's a kink in the dialectic. You know, when that happens, uh, and so uh, I, I do feel that uh, in an independent Scotland, we will see a brighter future for all the creatives. Yeah. Great. And do you think that's why so many creatives have got behind the independence movement? I think so. Yeah, I think they see the. Do you think that's true? I think so. I think uh, out of the people that I know creatively, I. I don't know if I know any no creatives, actually, <laughs> thinking about it. Uh, I've met no people, but they're not particularly creative. <laughs> <laughs>
we kept, I don't think we didn't have a. I think we're going to move on uh, now, Stephen. Is that that's okay? Well, thank yes, you. Thank, thank you for having me. Yeah. Really thank great. You Thanks very much. Thank and as promised, Sarah Beattie Smith is back with us. Sarah. Hello. Yeah. So you've been managing our Twitter account. Uh, what's happening? It's been going absolutely wild. Um, lots of people are listening to us live at the moment um, mm. and looking forward to watching us live or watching us recorded later on this afternoon. Um, lots of people are very interested to hear about theatre as a, as a tool for talking about the Scotland that we want to create and um, interested about theatre being a way of uh, a ground for, for troublemakers, I mm. think, as, as Libby was saying. So yeah. that's <laughs> striking a few chords with people. OK, well, you've been looking into radical independence campaigns, mass uh, canvas what's that all about well we went along on Wednesday night and we'll we'll have a film up uh, imminently um, the, about what we what we found there um, so the radical independence campaign of which I'm a part um, in it with a different hat on from today um, is is a, a kind of maybe maybe left of centre campaign around independence um, and it's really looking to be an alternative to the, the mainstream debate about keeping the pound and the currency and um, mm. and keeping the, the kind of system that we've already got. It's something different different from what we've got at the moment from what the Yes campaign in general is saying. Um, so it's, it's looking at maybe a republicanism, a bit of, bit of socialism mm. um, and there's some really interesting work there trying to reach out to people in communities where no one has ever really reached out to them before. It's the people who quite often don't right. vote because yeah. they feel disempowered. They think, what's, what's the point? Every, every politician is the same. There's nothing in it for me. Mm. Um, for the working class voters who feel that maybe the Labour Party has left them, um, or maybe aren't convinced by the SNP's yeah. arguments, the Radical Independence Campaign is reaching out to those people and listening to what they've got to say, yeah. not just preaching to them. And what, do they have, what do they have to say to you? So um, I didn't make it out actually on the yeah, doorsteps okay. on Wednesday night, but what we're hearing from the campaigners themselves and when I went out with them last month um, was that for a lot of people, when you turn up on their doorstep, it's the first time anyone's ever asked them what they think about politics. Mm -hmm. And that in itself is an incredibly powerful thing. Mm -hmm. um, and they're feeling rather disenfranchised. They don't really understand um, many aspects of the debate and they don't really get why the currency or European membership yeah. matters to them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They want to know what's, what's going to be different in their lives? How can they have more power? How can democracy actually make a difference in their lives? Well, you're actually in the Yes campaign, but you're in the, you come from the Green Movement, I you're do. a Green Party uh, activist. So do you get frustrated then when you see, you know, the debate dominated by, well, Alex Salmond and the SNP? Well, I think it's fairly inevitable that it's going to be SNP dominated. They're in government, uh, they started the campaign, but I think it's really important that Green Voices get out there too, and that people know that the SNP is not the only choice for how we run Scotland after a Yes vote um, that you know we got an election in 2016 there's an awful lot of people out there to choose from whether it be green or SSP or Labour or SNP indeed and mm. um, for us it's things like having a, a better social security system like citizens income which is something that we've talked about today it's just been launched mm. um, it's about actually having our own currency and um, maybe using the, tr the pound as a transitional measure so you're for plan B well, it's, it's our own kind of plan B, I suppose, and there are so many options out there that we could choose from. I think we don't need to string ourselves up just now with, with that mm, kind of debate. Yeah. Sorry, I interrupted you in full flow. No, that's absolutely fine. No OK, well, tell us more about the uh, citizen's income. So citizens' income is, is an idea that's actually been around for about 40 years or so. Um, it's essentially a, a way of doing social security differently. Uh, it's not means tested. It is a universal mm. income for every man, woman and child uh, living in the country. Um, and you are in, at the moment, the numbers that we've put out today is £50 a week for children, £100 a week for adults, 150 for pensioners. Um, and it replaces the means tested benefits that we have today, like job seekers allowance. Mm. Um, you would still get things like housing benefit on top of that. Mm. but it is essentially a payment to ensure that you can cover the basic cost of living mm. and beyond that you pay tax on whatever you earn um, but it's an idea that I think would help a lot of the writers and creatives the kind of people that we're talking to throughout mm. the Fringe show um, whose income we heard this morning is maybe around five grand a year if you're a writer mm. that's the sort of average income for a writer that's, 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 that's a, the average income is about five grand I remember James that's Kelman one of the prize-winning Scottish, fam one of the most famous Scottish novelists said he never earned more than £5,000 a year, which is pretty yeah. salutary. <laughs> and imagine the freedom that you would have if your basic cost of living were covered. Um, collectively, as a real social security net, as a collective responsibility, I think it could be a really freeing thing. And it's an idea for a really radical change in Scotland that independence would allow us to... Now, people say, how could you afford that? Though? 
Well, it, it's paid for out of progressive taxation, much more progressive than we have right now. Mm. Um, and that collective sense of responsibility actually encourages economic um, activity as well. Is the Scottish Government, do you think, up for it? There's some murmurings in, in various bits of the SNP. Um, bizarrely, the Thatcher government actually looked at it back in the 80s to see if it was viable, and they thought it was, but just politically difficult for them to introduce. So. <laughs> <laughs> OK, well, thanks very much, Sarah. Uh, on that note, we'll, we'll send you back now to carry on your Twitter management. Thanks very much. Uh, that's all really for us for today. Thank you very much. Um, I'm Neil McQuarter. This has been Stephen Payton as well. Tomorrow uh, there will be uh, who? lots of people on. Lane C. Smith's going to be on doing an Alan Bissett's uh, play Pure Dead Brilliant and her own one-woman one show. And also we'll be having David Heyman, uh, who's been doing his show Pitiless uh, Storm. But for me and Stephen, uh, after a rather chaotic uh, referendum live, that's all from us just now. Goodbye. <laughs> <laughs>